Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session will begin in two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator for the next session, Kasia Madeira. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, welcome. Thank you for once again joining me in what is going to be a critical conversation now, because ultimately, as the headline of this conversation implies, this is really important. We are talking about peace now, and the ultimate question, how? And that's what we're here all about. Peace is ultimately the most important thing. We're looking at war zones across the world. Of course, we are focusing in on Ukraine. And what I want to ask you throughout this conversation with my esteemed guests is to engage with me questions forward, whether it's raising your hands, whether it's via the, the, the online app, but also to answer a very, very simple question. I want to ask you, peace in Ukraine, when will we see it? This year, next year, sometime, or heaven forbid, never. Get voting and we'll come, we'll refer throughout the day, throughout this next hour to that poignant question because ultimately it's a it's a nursery rhyme but let's just remember that this is what we are here to focus in on and I have an extremely esteemed panel of guests that I would like you to join me in welcoming so ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together joining us live from Kiev in what is a critical time at the moment Igor Zhovka, the deputy head of the office of the president of Ukraine. Also joining us, Ambassador Mati Masikas, the ambassador of the European Union, head of the EU delegation to Ukraine. General John R. Allen, a former United States Marine Corps, four-star general, ladies and gentlemen, former commander of NATO's International Security Assistance Force. And also Ivan Korchak, a former minister of foreign and European affairs of the Slovak Republic. Gentlemen, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed panel. Please sit. So immediately, Igor Zhovka, Deputy Head of the Office of the President of Ukraine, we're starting with you because we know what is happening right now. We've had attacks on Kyiv. I know you're rushing off to meet President Zelensky for a very important meeting. Tell us, peace in Ukraine, what is that for you? How does that look for you? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, uh, to the organizers of this uh, very important uh, event. Uh, I know GlobSec also all, all, always is a platform for the best uh, 
high-level leaders, uh, experts, politicians to get together to discuss the current events in the world. Second so take on our topic of this panel, really, it's really difficult for me now to speak about the peace. It's a little difficult for me to speak about the peace after several nights and days in Kyiv. Uh, uh, sometimes, some more than a year ago, a peaceful Kyiv, which used to be very beautiful at this time of year, in the end of May. But already throughout this night, we had an attack of 31 drones, only uh, aimed at the uh, civilian infrastructure at Kyiv. And unfortunately, despite the previous nights, when we also had the attacks of drones combined with the attacks of ballistic and cruise missiles, and yesterday, yesterday night and day, we had three waves of attacks, including by 10 missiles of Iskander types, a ballistic missiles, which were intersected, by the way, all, all 10 of them. But today in the night, unfortunately, several drones hit the civilian targets, and unfortunately, we have one victim, we have more than 10 casualties, and uh, several people are staying in the hospitals in their critical conditions. So this is the result of the actions of the country, which, which very frequently, you know, exposes this narrative about peace. You know, somehow it, it, it's probably a weird combination, but as soon as they regain these severe attacks, because I have the statistic here, only in these several days of May, they fired almost 20% of missiles and drones, which were fired starting from October last year. When you remember, they renewed the, these attacks on critical infrastructure of Ukraine, trying to hit uh, the energy object, trying to freeze us in the, in the winter. They failed. Then there was a pause, and now they resume. And at the same time, so the, the officials are resuming their proposals for peace negotiations. We hear it from some lower level officials, like deputy ministers of foreign affairs, and from other politicians that let's go back to peace, but peace will be on Russian conditions. Peace will mean accepting the so-called new realities, as they quote it. Peace will be depriving uh, Ukraine of uh, the military help from any uh, Western state. Peace will be forbidden uh, of Ukraine to join NATO and the EU. It's the same with the infamous words about denazification, demilitarization, and others, D, we heard in the beginning of this open aggression. So if you're a country which which talking about peace, which suggesting peace, you probably do not fire at the civilian objects. You don't kill civilian people. You don't do it in the night. You don't also do it in the daytime. And you're really thinking about peace, which is probably definitely not the case with the aggressor state of Russia. Well, if you ask me if in Ukraine, Ukrainians do want peace, my answer will be very, very, very short and precise. We Ukrainians is the biggest nation in need of peace. Because the war is going on on the Ukrainian territory, the open war is going on the Ukrainian territory, of almost 500 days already, and the war itself is going already nine years, starting from 2014. And you might remind ourselves yourselves that we tried to use this uh, this paradigm, which was inherited by my president from the previous presidents of governments. I'm talking about Normandy format. I'm talking about trilateral contact group, so-called Minsk group. And for several years, my president tried in vain to say that definitely uh, we do not want to have any armed conflicts. Uh, but at the same time, we will not let any single part of Ukrainian territory be forever controlled by an aggressor state. So now, when the open aggression started, and it's going on already, and Ukraine managed to withdraw 50% of the territory which Russia managed to get under, after this open aggression, uh, our answer is very simple. The only peace and the only way how peace can be established on the territory of Ukraine is 
through using peace formula suggested by President Zelensky on November 15th last year, the G20 summit, where, we clearly, where he clearly laid down 10 points of peace formula. What are these points about? They are very simple and concrete and concise. They are about depriving Russia from the instruments of aggression on other, area, on other areas, not on the land the battlefield. You take item number one, and this is about nuclear safety and security. An aggressive country cannot blackmail all of us, threaten all of us by using the nuclear weapon. And at the same, at the same time, aggressive state cannot take, capture the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, which is Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, to, help, to hold personnel as hostages, to kidnap the children of the personnel. And the world pays no attention to this. The aggressor state cannot deprive all of us from the usual trade routes uh, from the Black Sea ports of Ukraine, not to get the grain, Ukrainian grain, to the poorest countries of uh, Africa and Asia. That's also an aggression. A state, a one state, cannot breach all, each and every point of UN Charter. A state cannot kidnap Ukrainian children. More than 20,000 of Ukrainian children illegally deported are already illegally deported from the territory of Ukraine. And the real numbers are 10 times bigger. You cannot endanger the environment. You cannot de mine, uh, mine the territory of Ukraine. Almost half of the territory of Ukraine is heavily mined as a result of this uh, open war. And we will, it will take us dozens of years to, 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 to demine. So this is about peace formula, and this is about our way to bring peace uh, to Ukraine. And the only effective way to immediately bring peace to Ukraine, and this is in uh, item seven of this peace formula, immediate withdrawal of all Russian troops from all the territory of Ukraine. So we're openly suggesting this peace formula to each and every country of the world. And you know, when my president is having the discussions with the world leaders, he always asks for the, to, the, uh, to the world leaders, please take this on the point of the peace formula. Take your country as a coordinator. Let's get together. Let's start our efforts. Let's have a peace formula summit as soon as possible, uh, preferably this summer, in order to start already implementing the possibilities for peace. My president, my president openly talks about this peace formula not only with Western leaders, but he was last week in Jeddah for the summit of the League of Arab States. He openly talked about this peace formula with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, with the leadership of United Arab Emirates, Oman, Kuwait, Iraq, and he was speaking before the 22 leaders getting together in Jeddah and saying Ukraine wants peace. You countries of the global south, you countries of the Gulf, were having your students coming to educate in Ukrainian universities. We're having your tourists come in visiting Ukraine two years ago. And so you suddenly, you also suffer from the aftermaths of Russian aggressions. The raise of uh, energy prices, uh, the raise of cost of living, it also implicates, it also affects your countries. And we were getting together in Hiroshima, G7 leaders, my president, and the leaders of other global South countries, Prime Minister of India, President of Brazil, uh, President of Indonesia, South Korea, and we were also discussing how and by which models of Iran to start already implement, not only talk about the idea of peace. And me personally, I haven't heard anything negative, any critical notes on the ideas expressed by my president. Certainly we hear that many countries are uh, appearing with their own ideas of peace, we heard some thoughts from China. We're hearing the words of President Lula. We're hearing the suggestions from South Africa. We're hearing the suggestions from Vatican. We are ready to listen and take into account all the suggestions proposed by, by the countries of the world. But the only way how the peace can be established in Ukraine is the Ukrainian peace formula. Sorry, but the war is going on on the territory of Ukraine. Any peace plan should be Ukrainian peace plan because we are the country who suffered. These are Ukrainians who are dying and we have all the rights to define what 
and in what scope and what we will understand as a victory and a peace for Ukraine. And that's what my president shares with the world community. But once again, we are ready to communicate and talk to each and every representative who wants to help us to implement peace. The time for mediators has finished. It's far away from any efforts or any efforts of the leaders, former politicians, to be a mediators. You cannot be a mediator in the war between the evil and good. You cannot be an honest broker getting some of your own profit, you know, when the war is going and on. Let's withdraw the Russian troops immediately. Let's start to implement the peace formula of Ukraine. And after implementing from well, items from one to nine, we have item 10, which is about negotiations, which is about the negotiations of condition of Ukraine's victory and future coexistence with this aggressive state of Russia. But at this negotiating table, my president will not be alone. He will sit together with each and every country who will be willing to take the responsibility for implementing the peace formula of uh, Ukraine. And all together, we, the civilized countries, will be sitting together at this table with someone who will be representing Russia and talking about the conditions of living. But before that, before the Russian troops are killing day by day, night by night, my compatriots, we probably will definitely talk, not talk about any possibilities of unjust peace, any possibility of conditioned peace, even any possibility of untruthful peace. Because any peace for, for, for Russia means only one thing as of today. A short pause, take a break, regroup, have additional waves of mobilization and renew the aggression against Ukraine and the whole civilized world. We are not opting for this, for this option. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for Igor Shovka, <laughs> Deputy Head of the Office of the President of Ukraine, who is leaving us right now to have a very important meeting with Volodymyr Zelensky right this moment, as you absolutely understand critical issues at hand. Igor Shovka, thank you so much for your time. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks to you. Thank you. A lot to discuss there, gentlemen. An awful lot. And I think we heard unconditionally Igor Zhovka say there that it is not, peace in Ukraine is not negotiable. It is not negotiable. So, Ambassador Masikas, let's start with you. I assume... I'm taking the liberty to assume that the EU agrees with everything that Mr. Zhovka said there. So in that case, if there is no negotiation, if it absolutely has to be on Ukraine's terms, how does peace look? When can it be achieved? Exactly when Ukrainians themselves are telling us that they are ready now. Uh, the terms of any future settlement and the terms of victory will be decided by Ukrainians. It's not, it's not for us. Until then, we support Ukraine in winning this war. Uh, Igor Zhovko touched upon several important issues. May I add uh, a couple of more? Ukraine, even at war times, Ukraine is a democracy. Ukraine functions as a state, as a democratic state. 97% of Ukrainians are convinced that Ukraine will win this war. 90% of Ukrainians uh, are against any territorial concessions. Only 23% of Ukrainians, according to a recent poll, support start starting negotiations with, with Russia. Um, and that's something that needs to be taken into account by, a, by the democratic leader of the country. The other issue that Igor Zhovkova also touched upon is that, like all neighboring countries to Russia and Ukrainians most notably, uh, very well know, if, if the hostilities were to, were to stop today, 
for the Russians, what's theirs is theirs, and of the rest, they can negotiate. And it has been made clear, the Kremlin has repeatedly said, of course, new realities need to be taken into account, and according to the decisions taken in Moscow, actually, four regions of Ukraine have incorporated into the Russian Federation. Um, that's, and it's not hard to understand why Ukrainians want to push the Russians out. And the third element that Igor also touched upon is the Ukrainians' um, very negative lessons and, and utter frustration on the diplomatic processes that took place between 2014 and, 20, and 2022. All the, all the nomadic formats, all the trilateral contract groups were used by Russia to buy time and to, and to prepare uh, for, a, for the full-scale war. And the Ukrainians are very wary of any, any um, seemingly well-meaning proposals or ideas for facilitation, and Igor made that very clear as well. Thank you, Ambassador. To pick up on that point, General Allen, the ambassador there mentioning 2014, with your hat on as a former commander of NATO, it was an epic fail that there wasn't more done at that time. 2014 was a critical time. NATO could have, should have done more. Well, we could have seen, uh, first, let me just make one quick point. There, there are a lot of young women and men around who are wearing green lanyards, uh, and I always point this out every year when I'm here. These are the individuals who are the facilitators of this great conference, but they're also the future for all of our countries. And uh, if you get a moment, please thank them for what they've done during this conference and ask them what they want to do with their future and encourage them to be ambitious as they go forward. And I want to thank them now. Um, we had lots of options that we could have employed back in 2014. Uh, to include the, the potential stationing of troops in Ukraine, not necessarily NATO troops. NATO doesn't have to act as an alliance in order to take those kinds of steps. Uh, but we did take important steps to begin the process of aggressive training of Ukrainian non-commissioned officers and other elements of the Ukrainian military. Uh, and I think that the combination of a of, of very clear uh, stationing of rapid response forces in the east. We took too long to do that in the eastern frontier of NATO. Uh, and the actual movement of certain uh, countries' uh, forces into Ukraine for the purposes of training, uh, not necessarily for deterrence, but for the purposes of training, would have sent a very unambiguous signal that the, uh, the members of the alliance, as opposed necessarily to the alliance itself, were deeply concerned about Russian aggression. Uh, and Igor said something really important, and I say this in public all the time. I worry that we become inured to the atrocity of what Russia has done to Ukraine. It's just become standard. We see it in the news. We're not impressed by it any longer. And we've got, we've got to all oppose that. We've got to all resist the normalization of Russian uh, behavior and just the expatriation of Ukrainian children is an atrocity that's just unspeakable. All the other things, of course, surround it. So we, need, we can't let this become normal. And I think as, uh, as we consider the future with respect to how NATO and the individual members of NATO will support Ukraine going forward, uh, all capabilities need to be on the table in that regard. General Allen, they're making a point about the normalization of the uh, the Putin's regime's behavior. It's not, of course, all Russians. We need to just um, absolutely keep that on the Very table. Very important point. Thank you. But just, just in terms of that, I, do we call it apathy? What do we call this? This kind of uh, tiredness of war? Ivan Korchok, when we talk about, when we hear about what Russia does, is there a, a, a disinformation war. Well, we know there is a disinformation war. We know that for certain. But is there a lack of apathy, a lack of potentially willingness to understand exactly what Putin's regime is doing, a misunderstanding about what is going on here? I would say yes, it is. It's vanishing. 
in a way. I'll elaborate more on that in a minute, but I was listening atten attentively to the speech of Igor Jovka, and you would remember what, he, what was his first sentence? He said, it is very difficult for me to speak about the peace. This is what Igor said. Why? Because there is yet another night behind them of coward attacks on civilians. People were running to the shelters. How come we take the liberty and comfort of speaking about the peace? I mean, it's, it's a logical question. What I want to say by that, this demonstrates that it can only be them who will speak about the, about the peace and the terms of, on which there could be peace. This is Russia's war. Therefore, there is no alternative but Ukraine's peace. And we can we'll stop here. And there is only one duty for us, for the international community, to support them as long as they are heroically losing their lives for their home country. We, I mean, we should approach all this, in this comfort of being at Globsec in Bratislava, in this safe and secure country, and to look with respect at what Ukrainians are doing. That's number one. Number two, Kasia, with your permission, and going back to your question about disinformation, about our inability to maintain the attention of our people to the horrible scenes that they're confronted with, This country, I'm not officially representing anymore, is lost the compass. It was Globsec, which presented a, a week ago a survey. And I don't want to circumvent it. I want to bypass the very reality that 51% of this society believe that it is Ukraine itself, plus the West who is responsible for, for this war. Therefore, I want to use this stage, if you want to misuse this stage here, because I'm communicating through this, because it's streamed with the public outside, and tell them, no, all of us in Slovakia, when I was a member of the government, this government, by supporting Ukraine, we are not prolonging war. We are only denying to subscribe to a kind of peace which is a guarantee for next war to come. And you, Kasia, you said that 2014, you referred to it, NATO should have done more. It's not NATO who should have done more. All the members of international community who are committed to the very principles of international order and UN Charter should have done more. The beginning of the war that we are witnessing now, the full-scale war, the beginning of it is our non-reaction in 2014. Because in 2014, legally, happened the same what happened last year in February. Different scale. Absolutely unacceptable that there is a lesson to be learned from, from our failure from 2014. But once again, I'm saying it to everybody in this country and, and all those who believe that by supporting Ukraine, by delivering military equipment, we are pro prolonging war. No, Slovakia wants peace. We want it now, but not at any cost and not to the detriment of the Ukraine's own sovereignty, because if so, that would be yet again a threat to Slovakia as well and to all countries who believed in the very principles that are enshrined in international order. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's important just to restate, this is your conference as well. Get involved, ask questions. This is a unique opportunity to have such a high caliber panel on. It is your opportunity to ask questions. I can ask thousands, but this is your moment. Um, I just want to bring you up to date with the results from the, the poll, which is still moving, so you can still vote, I'm sure. But when will peace come to Ukraine? And I asked this question, it's, it's from a nursery rhyme, and Igor Zhovka touched upon the children that are forcibly being 
adopted in Russia, the children that are even last night hiding in shelters in Kyiv. So let's just, I was thinking, is it too flippant to ask this question? But I don't think so, because at the heart is always the younger generation and the children. When will peace come to Ukraine? This year? Next year, sometime or never. And overwhelmingly, you are saying sometime. Very frighteningly, some of you are even saying never. And I guess ultimately, it is what peace looks like. Please put your questions forward. If you raise your hands or if you put them through on the uh, GlobeSec uh, online forum, I can get those to our esteemed panel. But in the meantime, let me take the liberty, Ambassador. We heard uh, both of our colleagues here talk about this 2014 being potentially a moment where the international community could have done more. The European Union also could have done more. I wonder why that opportunity wasn't taken when we saw the annexation of Crimea to begin with. It was seen by um, most of the Western countries as a, as a small conflict in a faraway country. It was not deemed important enough. And I fully agree with, my, uh, with, with Ivan, uh, my former colleague and good friend, when he says, we all collectively bear responsibility uh, for the inaction between 2014 and, and 2022. There were some countries, like France and Germany, who were part of the, of the um, Normandy format, and they, 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 they guard it pretty, um, pretty attentively that it's a their format. They, they assured everybody that there is a diplomatic process and, and miscalculated. But the rest of us also took some comfort in telling ourselves, ah, but the diplomatic process is there. Uh, things are being, are being done. It's just um, all in all, uh, a gross miscalculation and underestimation of the threat of the Russian threat and uh, m miscalculation of the situation. A miscalculation, a miscalculation of the situation, but I just want to press you a little bit further, and we've got some fantastic questions coming through already. Thank you. Um, an awful lot of anonymous questions. Do feel free to put your names down. It would be great to, to accredit these great questions. Ambassador, um, Hungary, let's just address this problem. Somebody is asking, does it cause a crucial problem that Hungary doesn't allow weapons to go through its territory to Ukraine? Is that a problem? I mean, arguably, obviously it is. What is your dialogue with Hungary? How are you talking to Orban? All decisions in the field of EU's common foreign and security policy are being taken, including that on sanctions, are being taken by consensus. And this consensus was always achieved. That's all I can say. Diplomatically put, thank you. Um, if anybody wants to pick up on that, please I want, do I want, so. I can. Go. We served together with Mati back in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. To his, uh, how should I say, diplomatic speak at this moment, because I now speak differently at this moment. He, was a, he belonged to a very hawkish group of those guys in 2014 who reminded us of us, European Union, um, back then of a need to react properly. And I want to use proper words for that, what happened in 2014. Not only what you said, we tend to appeasement. We believe, okay, it happened 2014, basically the military, m m military actions were over, we got it under control, as if nothing happened. Do we remember when Nord Stream 2 was built? Wasn't that after Crimea? And we in Slovakia, I myself and other folks in Poland and elsewhere, we were perceived as the one who were overdoing that with Russian threats. What happened now with that? That's the consequence we are facing at this moment. And Hungary, it is a problem. It, of course it is a problem. You would, believe with, uh, you, you would agree with me, Mati, but you cannot say it. 
It is a problem not in technical terms that we are missing the Hungarian route through which weapons are delivered. They are delivered, no problem. But the problem is of, of political interpretation because there are many, including in this country and elsewhere, who are pointing and referring to Hungarian position as being a more sovereign one than the position of countries like Poland and Slovakia and Czech Republic and elsewhere in Central Europe who say, well, okay, you, it's just, you are just American puppets and you're delivering the weapons, and you're prolonging the war. Look at the Hungarians, how sovereign the policy is. This is the problem, because that's a referential point for all the, all the coward guys, I'm using that, that word second, for the second time, because they're driving the wedge. You know, and if this country, in, in, in the elections in this country, there is a bad outcome, when there is a change of policy, it could mean deeper cracks in a, in a unity that is so key for all of us to support Ukraine. That's the problem. I'm going to get into trouble for asking this, but Ambassador, do you want to reflect? Is, is Hungary a problem? <laughs> I, th I, th I think we both said what we have to say on this. <laughs> okay, fine. I think we're diplomatically put. Um, we've got a lady in the front who has got a question, and we've got a microphone that is making its way to you straight away. So I'll refrain from asking one of our online questions. Yes, please, madam. Thank you. Uh, I have rather comment than a question. I mean, it's not only Hungary. Every conference you go, there are people who say or say in the corridors, as soon as there is some kind of whichever uncomfortable peace, yes. then we will, of course, have to return to some kind of relations, rebuild business relations with Russia, etc., etc. Even today, in the face of this aggression and these atrocities, this has not changed. Let's face it. It's like you want you in the bolts. Baltic states, you want to isolate Russia. They're there. They will always be there. Accept reality. I mean, yes, they will be there, but so are Iran, so is North Korea. I mean, what is going on? So let's not concentrate on Hungary. It's much bigger problem. Much bigger problem. A much bigger problem. Can we just appreciate that this is the former President Kalulade. Thank you so much for your question. It's a bigger problem. Thank you. Um, General Allen, how do you address that, sure. a bigger problem on such a scale? Well, I was going to take a nap here between the two of these <laughs> diplomats. That was, uh, that was a good exchange they were taking. Was it too diplomatic? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> Madam President has really put her finger on it. We have not informed our publics about what is at risk here. Uh, and the, the theory that war occurs outside of the context of the larger conflict is really what we have to understand. We have been in conflict with Russia for decades. That didn't end really at the end of the Cold War when the Soviet Union ceased to exist. We have been at, in, a, in a position of conflict with Russia for a very long time. Estonia uh, was buffeted by an attack during that era of conflict from the cyber domain in ways that we've not seen in other NATO countries in many respects. But we are, we are in the West in conflict with the Russians every single day. And they choose in the context of that conflict when the conditions are right for it to progress into a situation of war. So there is war and there is conflict. The larger, uh, the larger context is the conflict. Let me just take a second because we have to educate our populations in this regard. In 92, we had Moldova. 96 to 2000, we had Chechnya, tens of thousands of civilians killed by Russian firepower. In 08, we had Georgia. Now you asked about in 14, Crimea, what did we do for Georgia? We didn't do much for Georgia either, frankly. Uh, that was 08, 014 was Crimea, 15 was Syria. I was fighting the Islamic State at the time in Syria and Iraq. Russians tr uh, propped up a genocidal dictator in Syria, killing hundreds of thousands of his own people. And then of course, uh, in 20 and 21, Belarus, where the Russians helped Lukashenko brutally put down the popular uprising. And in January of 22, put down a popular uprising in Kazakhstan and then invaded Ukraine. This is 10 major invasions and the suppression of popular uprisings over 30 years. Do we think it's going to end by appeasing the Russians in Ukraine? 
So the outcome has got to be to provide the support to the Ukrainians to defeat the Russians so that in the end, the European security architecture is in such a deterrent state that Ukraine is, st is stable and secure and the European security architecture is secure and the forcible change of borders as an instrument of state power by the Russians. And by the way, they're the only ones who have done this in this century. That instrument of state power is denied to them henceforth. We've got to educate our populations on the relationship between the conflicts and the wars that we're fighting. Can I pick you up on that, though? Educate your populations, fine. <clears throat> but the, incur the, the incursion, the invasion into Georgia, 2008, 2010, Russia had a seat at the NATO table. Sure. President Medvedev was uh, then President Medvedev. They were flip-flopping. Remember that? Um, he was at the table at NATO. So you're saying educate the populace. Sure, yeah, we want to be educated. We really do because, Evan, we don't want misinformation. People have to, be, you know, they get their information somewhere. So General Allen, how do you, you know, do what we, what's the saying? Do what I say, but not what I do when it comes to NATO? Well, we've got a lot of people out there saying. We've got to have a lot of people out there doing. Uh, and when countries, for example, the 2% issue, uh, we've been saying for a very long time that countries have to commit to 2% uh, as, a th as a floor. Uh, if, if there is any motivation, and Mark Esper was here the other day and he talked about the numbers, it's a very small number of NATO that, that have met their commitment to 2%. Uh, and it was a voluntary commitment to 2% and it was a floor. If there was any potential impetus or justification for all NATO powers to now lean forward and pay and, and go to 2% or beyond 2%, as Estonia has done. Uh, this is it. I don't know what else could be the motivator for NATO to begin to commit and do as opposed to simply say. And I think that's going to be a major portion of the, the conversation when we get to Vilnius next month. I think, yeah, absolutely, you're right. Let's get a question from the gentleman here in the, the second row, please. Hi, I'm uh, Bruno Massines. I'm a writer. I used to be Ivan Zanmati's colleague at, at the council. Uh, my question is for General John Allen. Uh, and this is uh, literally the elephant in the room. Uh, what happens if Donald Trump uh, or Ron DeSantis wins the election? What happens for the peace process? They're on record saying that uh, they favor a kind of peaceful land deal. Yeah. Well, Donald Trump can sort it out in a day, can't he? That's what he said. What he said. Well, that's, well it's, a, it's a problem. De 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 DeSantis which way the wind is blowing on any particular moment and day, you know, he'll figure out what the position is that, that suits the audience that he's uh, talking to. Uh, but Trump is a very serious problem. It's not just a very serious problem for Ukraine. It's a very serious problem for the United States of America and freedom and democracy around the world. So I, I don't want to be ambiguous in my response, but uh, that's how I feel about that. Uh, the, the, we have very strong uh, Republican, potential Republican candidates. Uh, in the United States coming up for the election. But these two are not going to be, if one, one or the other of them is elected, these, these two are not going to favor the outcome in Ukraine, my fear is. It's quite uh, chilling hearing that, isn't it? The lady in the front here, if we can get a microphone to you. Um, and we've got a lot of questions coming online as well. So I'm going to go to an online one after you, madam. Yes, thank you. My name is Victoria Wojcicka and I represent the International Center for Ukrainian Victory. I'm a former member of Ukrainian Parliament. And um, from what I hear during this discussion, it seems like we're trying to learn the lessons and make right conclusions and decisions from the mistakes that were done in the past. And one of the mistakes that was done was the uh, 2008 NATO summit, uh, the lost opportunity of actually securing the uh, peace on European continent. And we, as Ukrainians, like no one else, want sustainable and long-lasting peace, which means Ukraine returns 100% of its territory. And I saw the question uh, on the screen about Crimea. Crimea is not for sale. It's not negotiable. It's Ukrainian territory. And for those who are asking that question, I just want to make a comment that for as long as Crimea stays within Russian control, it poses a threat for all NATO members, for all NATO countries, for uh, Black Sea region, for Mediterranean uh, region as well. But most importantly, 
lasting sustainable peace will be achieved when Ukraine becomes NATO member, because it's not just in the interest of Ukraine, but the whole alliance to have a strong partner capable to fight the real enemy with the trained soldiers, with the capabilities. And we do hope, and this is my question to you, we do hope that we will get an invitation to NATO in Vilnius this year, because there is no excuse of dragging this issue for another year when next elections will take place in the US, and that will be another excuse for not creating us an invitation. For how long and what should we do to get finally that invitation for Ukraine? Thank you. So let's just bring in that your point and also that point that, that, that you refer to, and this is uh, one of those questions that you guys have been upvoting massively if Ukraine accepts that Crimea is part of Russia, would it be an end of the war? I've, we heard from Mr. Jovka, it is not negotiable. But let's play devil's advocate. Ambassador, your thoughts? Well, we have seen already the situation where Russia was in, in the possession of the Crimea, or, or, of, of Crimea and it did not prevent uh, further, further war. Uh, I fully, I fully subscribe to the to the pathos and the logic of the of the question, and also that of uh, of general uh, of the general's remarks. Um, speaking of the mistakes of the past, I think the biggest, or at the very beginning of that, stood how the West treated. Russia after Russia had lost the Cold War. We wanted to be kind, nice, peaceful, to embrace Russia. And it turned out to be a colossal mistake. Because Russia, as soon as Russia felt again a bit more strengthened, they started to planning how to get back everything that they had lost in 1991. So I very much hope that when, this, when Russia will have lost the current war, we will not repeat this mistake. Thank you. Victor, thank you. Do, do react, absolutely react. This is your conference. Um, Victoria was asking about Ukraine's NATO membership. What about EU membership? I'm just going to put this again to you, sir, Ambassador. It's very, very right thing that the EU collectively was able to uh, rise to the occasion. Uh, it's no secret that the 23rd of February last year, there was virtually no ap appetite even discuss opening uh, the EU's membership perspective to any further country. And the EU by becoming geopolitical, rose to the occasion and offered the, the path. And I take it, um, it's a huge responsibility now to act on it. Because there are some other membership processes for Ukraine that have lasted for 15 plus years and that have not moved much. With the EU, it's um, pretty well ongoing at the moment. There is a fair chance if um, Ukraine uh, delivers on the seven recommendations uh, that were given by the EU, there's a fair chance that, that membership negotiations could be started uh, later this uh, later this year. There is awful lot of uh, things need still to be done done uh, by Ukraine, then the Commission assessment, and the, uh, again a unanimous decision by the member states. But but there is hope at the moment, and that's very important. President Zelensky has repeatedly said, and I I feel that living in Kiev every day. The EU symbolizes hope. This EU membership, becoming a becoming full-fledged member of the EU, that gives hope to Ukrainians. And that's very important for us not to miss the chance. EU membership gives hope. General NATO membership, when can we see that? I hope 
uh, at Vilnius. I don't have, I hope at Vilnius, I'm not sure that it'll happen. You know, the worst thing that can happen uh, for a country that is contemplating uh, being part of NATO is the situation you talked about, the Bucharest summit. You're either in NATO or you're not in NATO. Where you don't want to be is being thought about about being part of NATO because Georgia was invaded by the Russians within months of the Bucharest summit in 08, which was a very clear sim uh, signal by the Russians that they weren't going to tolerate this, uh, this um, in-between status that both Ukraine and uh, Georgia have, uh, have existed in. I think that's a destabilizing status, not a stabilizing status. You're either in or you're out, but being in the gray zone puts you at risk and it puts the, the architecture for security at risk as well. It's, it's pretty clear what it means to be um, in the gray zone. Um, not Vilnius, we'll all look to Vilnius. We are talking about uh, peace. How will it look? When can we expect it? And we do, you know, we, have, we have to expect it. We have to have hope. The ambassador talking about hope there. Uh, Ivan, I want to put this question to you that's uh, pretty popular amongst our uh, audience. We're talking about peace. So let's just look at, flip it a little bit and look at Russia's if you've got peace, you've got a winner, you've got a loser, you've got defeat. What does Russia's defeat look like? And how does a nuclear state, how do you defeat a nuclear state? The, I think, or I have doubts whether it is appropriate to speak about the defeat as such of Ukraine, because that inevitably um, raises the question how a nuclear power can be defeated, barely, I say, realistically, and barely. And maybe I would disappoint some who dream of defeat of Russia, but I think it's fair to say that the end game, if you want, is not that the troops, that the Ukrainian troops would be marching to Moscow. That's not about that, because some are arguing that, you know, we want to defeat Russia that way. No, what we want is just to restore the order, restore exactly the principles that Russia has subscribed to several times and many times within OEC or within the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, where Ukraine has delivered, but Russia has not delivered. So let's be realistic in what we can expect. That brings me also to the issue with you, Victoria, is that right? Logically you have raised, namely NATO membership. Worse than appearing in a gray zone as John Allen uh, has, you know, rightly referred to, is to raise unrealistic expectations. I wish there, there would be decision in Vilnius to invite Ukraine to become member of NATO. How, however, I don't think we are that far. Why? Because we all remember what was 2008, what happened afterwards. We were not able to come to a consensus to give you a partnership for, sorry, membership action plan. I know that's not enough for you, neither when it comes to NATO, nor when it comes to European Union. But you know what is the tangible outcome of your heroic fight already? You have become part of the West. So it's not anymore Ukraine, which is somewhere on the Russian orbit, where you don't know which part of your population is still with its mind somewhere in Russia or not. Thanks to the victims and your heroic fight. There is no other option for Ukraine but to become of what I believe is a political West. It's not a geographical West. You will be where you are today. And therefore, your future is in European Union. And the fact that it will not happen tomorrow should not disappoint you and give up on that. I, agree. I cannot agree more with what Mati has said. We have to deliver, I mean the European, European Union, on our part, by opening negotiations. That's yet another commitment on our side, which we, which we make clear to you that we are not playing games here, but you're on the way to European Union. But I would advocate once again, 
uh, for a, a realistic approach at this moment. There is no consensus. Uh, before Vilnius, there will barely be consensus for inviting Ukraine to become a member now. But it happened a lot already, thanks to the courage and, once again, a heroic, heroic fight of your people. I just want to say, when, when Ivan was uh, talking there about what, a, a, um, you don't want to use the word defeat, but what a potential uh, end to this looks like, when you were talking about not rolling tanks into Moscow, Victoria was shaking her head so rigorously in agreement with that. It's the reinstating of the status quo, which is so important. General, you wanted to make a point on this. Sure, and I'm not sure that what status quo we're talking about. I, th I think the end, yeah, state, yeah. the end state is the defeat of the Russian conventional forces in Ukraine. Uh, and, and from, and I don't know what that means either, uh, but to set well, the if conditions- If you don't know, then we're no, in No, no, I, I do know. <laughs> I, I, believe me, I do know. Uh, but they set and the conditions how, through, <laughs> yes, I do know how to also, uh, set the conditions through conventional military operations for the defeat of the Russian forces to the extent that the Russians come to the table for peace negotiations, ultimately that results in the withdrawal of all Russian forces, forces from Ukraine and Crimea. It reestablishes the territorial integrity uh, of uh, Ukraine and Crimea, holds Russian uh, officials uh, accountable for their war crimes and the crimes against humanity. Uh, and, but ultimately, and to Victoria's point, and I don't think anybody's interested in doing this, moving past the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And you have to fight to get to that point. You have to fight to set the conditions for the kinds of peace uh, negotiations that can ultimately result in the Russian withdrawal. But the question was a bigger question than that is, it's, it's about dealing with the delivering a tactical defeat to a nuclear power. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. The United States has been very clear because the question implies that the Russians may use nuclear weapons. The United States has been very clear that we operating unilaterally, not with NATO, but we operating unilaterally would inflict catastrophic damage upon the Russians if that were to happen. We haven't said what that's going to be, but we know what catastrophic damage would look like. They have to think about that, number one. Number two, when the Russians signed up on the 4th of February, uh, 2022 with the Chinese in uh, what appears to be one of the strongest relationships they've ever had, part of what happens when you sign up with the Chinese is to understand the Chinese doctrine for nuclear employment. And the first is the Chinese have promised in their doctrine, and I've worked with them on this, that they will never use nuclear weapons on a state that does not possess nuclear weapons, mm. number one. And number two, they will never use nuclear weapons first. So as Vladimir Putin, and he's backed away from some of these nuclear saber rattlings, Medvedev still does, but he's backed away from it. He's got to have those considerations in his mind. The absolute certainty that there will be a U.S. retaliation of some form or another, and the fact that his number one partner, in fact, the senior partner in this relationship, has a nuclear doctrine that doesn't support any dimension of the employment of nuclear weapons in that, in that case. And very sadly, and I'll answer somebody else for this, having said this, the United States is a very powerful nuclear state, most powerful on the planet, and we've been defeated by conventional forces. So it can happen. We never contemplated using nuclear weapons in the wars that we have been in. That's for the strategic deterrence of other nuclear powers. And I think that's important to understand. Yeah. Can I just pick you up? Thank you. Please do. Um, just, we've got, um, General, while you're focusing in on China, we've got a particular question from Heinrich Kreft, who is asking about um, you're talking about China and Russia. President Zelensky has spoken to Xi Jinping and he's talked about uh, talking positively with him. Just briefly, if you could, what's the, what potential role could China have given that China is in, in very close proximity sure. now with Russia? We've, we believe from the beginning that China would have a role in some kind of a peace outcome. We think it's taken way too long. The Chinese could probably have, uh, very early in this conflict, at least created a ceasefire from which then the conversation could have gone forward for the ultimate Russian withdrawal. Uh, but we have believed from the beginning that the Chinese, and Xi has his own 12-point plan, which you might be shocked to learn favors the Russians. Uh, but nonetheless, the Chinese have uh, offered to be instrumental or at least helpful with good offices to try to broker a, a peace plan. And uh, the fact that uh, the Ukrainian president uh, met with Xi, I think, is a, is a very powerful message. Uh, I could see, 
again, this is going to have to be on Ukrainian terms. If the, if the Ukrainians would love to have uh, the Chinese or want to have the Chinese involved in the conversation, uh, and I think the Chinese would probably be very interested in the reconstruction piece of this thing, uh, that, uh, that that would be something that we should favor. Ivan, do come in on that, and then we're going to go to the gentleman over there, just briefly, yeah, if you I would. I wanted to add to this China point. Uh, I don't know when was it when China presented that was not a peace plan, at least we have not considered that being a peace plan. What was it, a statement or proposal? You, you would remember. And it was logically rebuffed and denied because China has in, even not asked Ukraine. They have consulted that prior to publication with Moscow. So, I mean, the destiny of that uh, statement was determined be before it was published. But there are two points in it, which I remember. Number one, commitment of China to the principle of territorial integrity. That's, that, that's something. And we should remind them of this. And number two, no use of nuclear weapons. Very important as well. And that goes into that direction that, that John Allen has mentioned. And point number three, I believe, we are not discussing that here. There will be another panel dedicated to that. But where we are, while we are united as the West, we are, I think, if I express it diplomatically, lagging behind or are not engaging sufficiently what we call global south because it's not only about china but there are others who are referred to as fence sitters so basically that's a it is a problem but they are not following for example the, the sanction policy and there is a big pro big problem with that therefore once again appreciation and appraisal to president zelensky who is not only leading his country and nation in Ukraine and in Kiev, but he is engaging in international diplomacy, as Ihozhovka has, has referred to in Riyadh, in Hiroshima and elsewhere. This is yet not another, but this is a parallel battlefield where, should, where we, supporting Ukraine, should be even more active. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman pa waiting patiently over there. Just a follow-up question for the general. I'm Christoph Ferres from the Warsaw Institute. Let's say that the Ukrainian counteroffensive succeeds. Let's say that all of the territories, including Crimea, is liberated. Why would the Russians sue for peace? They could just go on shooting rockets and drones whenever they want, basically freezing the conflict. In 1812, when Napoleon occupied Moscow, the Russians didn't ask for peace. Well, my own view is I, I think we're a ways from uh, conventional Ukrainian military operations recapturing Crimea. Uh, so that's, that, I think that's a reality check that we have to uh, undertake. But it, we are not going to wake up one morning, to your question, we're not going to wake up one morning and Ukrainian tanks are consolidating on the eastern bank of the Crimea. That process is going to unfold for some period of time. And I think it, uh, we, what we would see is a uh, growing desire by the Russians to uh, avoid the complete catastrophe of their conventional military defeat by the uh, Ukrainians and be willing to have the conversation necessary for the evacuation of Russian forces rather than the decisive defeat of Russian forces. And I think there's a difference between the two. Can I, can I follow up? Uh, the question implies that Russia has... has all the time on their side. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Uh, for instance, take the Western sanctions on, uh, that are crippling Russia's economy and their ability to finance this war. These would, in that, uh, in that theoretical situation, stay in place and it does, doesn't have to mean that Russia has the time on the side. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fascinating Great. point. And just while we've got um, our attention now on Russia, there's a question that's being asked. Uh, is there any daily communication between Russia and the Ukrainian government? Um, but I'm also interested, Ambassador, if, if I can put this to you, communication between the Kremlin and the EU. There must be those back channels ongoing he's not going to answer this is he 
even harder to comment on than on some of your previous uh, previous questions. Have to um, the way what what I can say um, uh, from Kiev, there were contacts during the first month of the of the uh, full scale war between between kiev and and moscow that ended after bucha was liberated and the very nature of of this russian aggression became became uh, open for for everybody um, and and again you heard what igor said um, very hard to see this. Uh, very hard to see that this context could be in place. I don't think so. Thank you for your candid reply. You've got to ask the questions, right? I'm not expecting uh, perhaps the ground, the, the, the top line story breaking reply, but I do appreciate your candor and putting up with my annoying questions. I would just like to thank my esteemed panel for taking the time to be pretty frank with us, I think, today. We've heard uh, some difficult things when we're talking about peace in Ukraine, which ultimately we all want, right? It's, it's, it's obvious. But I want to start just remembering, reminding everybody what Igor Zhovka said and just reminding what is going on in the ground. People are dying right now. There's a war in Europe and we have to keep continuously remembering the civilian population that is suffering so, so much. So to Igor Zhovka, who is right now speaking to President Zelensky, to Ambassador Masikas, General Allen and Ivan Korshak, thank you so much for joining us here today as we speak about a critical issue, peace in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you.